Okay, so today our lesson is called the Conservation Controversy. And uh, this is one that's near and dear to my heart, so I saved it for the end. And um, the question that we have to consider is, can the nation balance conservation with economic progress? Can we really go green without having to hurt our economic progress? I am 13 years old, I'm in 8th grade, and I go to Ventura Charter School. I never knew about climate change at all until I saw Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Kids are the ones who will be most affected by global warming. By the time we're middle-aged, climate change will be a huge crisis if nothing is done today to help us. I went ahead and I made my own presentation, um, and I made mine especially for kids, and I incorporated videos and animation and hands-on demonstrations so that kids would be excited about it. I have the website, kidsversusglobalwarming.com. The passion has been Alex, and he kept coming up with ideas, like one night he designed all of these I Matter logos. Mom, look what I did at 2 in the morning. Here's our first 20-second video. I also came up with an idea to alert my city, Ventura, about the dangers of sea level rise and how it will affect us. The project is called SLAP. SLAP stands for Sea Level Awareness Project. Because of global warming, polar ice caps are melting, causing the sea level to rise. And if Greenland completely melted, which could happen in the next century, sea level would rise over 20 feet worldwide. This would be Ventura. So here's what we'll be doing. We're going to be putting up over 100 poles throughout the city warning of this potential sea level rise. On the pole, there's the I Matter campaign. And then there's also five or six images that show what we can do about it. This is the Declaration of Independence for Coal and Oil. And it's from the youth of Ventura. Installed these poles throughout the beach that show that warn of the future sea level rise because of global warming. There's a line at the top showing that, that whoever's looking at the pole would be underwater right here where we are if we do nothing about global warming and Greenland completely melts, which would cause sea levels to rise 23 feet worldwide. I want to make it clear that kids have power. We have the power to make a difference. If we don't respond to climate change, then my grandchildren will climb into my lap and ask me about the olden days. I'll tell them about when there used to be amazing animals like penguins and polar bears. Or the world will be drastically different in another way, if we do make the changes we need to make.
So I'll include the full videos on the online version. But um, I wanted to share with you some examples of ways that you can get involved. And that young man shows community activism. But first, a little historical perspective. Conservation is the careful management and protection of the Earth's resources. This began first as a national movement in 1900 uh, in the United States. Uh, during this time known as the logging era, uh, much of our economy was focused on resource extraction, meaning viewing our nature as a resource that can be consumed for profit regardless of impact. Um, and during the movement to conserve these precious resources, the federal government enacted numerous measures to protect the nation's surroundings. Uh, in fact, the very first president to express a deep passion for conservation was one of my favorites, Teddy Roosevelt, and I've included a quote from him here. Like other men who had thought about the national future at all, I had been growing more and more concerned about the destruction of the forest. Teddy Roosevelt went on to establish the first wildlife refuge in Florida, and during his presidency added over 150 million acres. Uh, to the nation's forest preserves. Team Marine is a group of students from Santa Monica High School. One problem that caught our eye were the effects that plastic bags have on the ocean. Living in a beach community that Santa Monica is, we were very aware of all the trash in the streets, in the ocean, and also the storm drains because not only do we get the litter that we create, but we also get everyone else's litter because it's all channeling into the ocean. There are multiple problems with plastic bags because while they may seem convenient, the production uses a lot of petroleum and uses a lot of energy, which is fossil fuel based and affects global warming. Annually, six billion plastic bags are made in Los Angeles County and less than 5% are recycled. The petroleum used to make 14 plastic bags can drive a car one mile. How much resources we use just to make these simple plastic bags that are a one-time use only is really not worth it. Well, most plastic bags end up in the ocean and it kills about 100,000 marine animals each year and close to a billion seabirds each year. What happens is they turn into small bits and go into the ocean and different sea animals uh, mistake it for food and then it ends up in their stomach and sadly they die. Most of what Team Marine did was community outreach, so we went in the community to educate others. We've done everything from participating in beach cleanups to actually hosting our own marches against plastic bags to testifying at city council to creating a video for others to watch and posting on YouTube to going into schools and doing lesson plans and also going to grocery stores and asking them, are you being environmentally friendly? We're here at the Santa Monica storm drain. Evelina and I decided to go down to the storm drain. Look at this shameful presence, people. Shameful. Oh, God. I'm blinded by its disgustingness. And we decided to track all the plastic bits that were um, coming from the storm drain and landing on the ocean. We decided to pay attention to these plastic bits because most animals, such as seagulls, different birds, and um, other marine life, when they see the trash, they don't recognize that it's a piece of trash. One million seabirds die annually because of plastic bags. These bags kill innocent little fishies, and they have oil and petroleum, which leads to global warming, and we don't want that. We held two marches to propose the ban on plastic bags in the city of Santa Monica. I'm never gonna forget the day we actually went down to City Hall Perfect. when they banned plastic. Just for the convenience, we produce something for just a few minutes of use, but it lasts many lifetimes. We were there till 1 a.m. and they finally said that they would ban plastic. They're the first city to actually put a ban on plastic and then put a tax on paper bags. Good evening, I'm the Santa Monica Plastic bag monster. I'm doing what I do best. I emit excess greenhouse gases, I litter the streets, I find my way into storm drains, 
And then I pollute the ocean, which therefore kills animals. Well, I'm just kind of wondering, it must, it must be kind of tough for a fellow like you to get a date. I myself, as a teenager, using reusable bags at a grocery store, I get looked at a lot because I'm a teenager, you know what I mean? Teenagers don't really use reusable bags, you know, they're not, it's not cool. But I mean, I think it's cool and <laughs> definitely uh, everyone can do it. We just need to take the initiative and we need to move a lot farther than we are right now. It's more, I feel, an ethical problem than an environmental problem because we all have the power to reduce our carbon footprint. If I could use a reusable bag and seriously take plastic bags out of my life, I'm sure anyone else can. It's really, it's just an easy step that everyone can do. And I'm sure if the county of Los Angeles can ban plastic bags, the whole nation can. This is a collective impact. It will have so much benefits for the world. All right, now, throughout the 19s and uh, 60s and 70s, uh, we began to see a resurgence of the conservation movement continuing into today, as you can see. Uh, one of the most powerful books to awaken many Americans to the dangers of uh, greenhouse gases and pesticides and pollution uh, was a book called Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And uh, along the same spirit as Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, it highlighted the dangers of pesticide use and made them personal for so many people. Uh, it, and it awakened many Americans to the damage that we were inflicting on our environment through very simple things that we weren't doing intentionally, but things that we weren't doing were causing um, irreversible damage. I'm Clarissa Klein. I've been with the Girl Scouts for ever since I was in kindergarten. I was um, really concerned about climate change. I've been a Girl Scout for seven years, and our troop organized the distribution of 5,000 light bulbs in the Bay Area and in San Francisco. I'm very worried about global climate change, because what about our grandchildren? They'll have to live with our mistakes, and they shouldn't have to pay for what we've done. Would you like, like a free CFL, CFL light bulb? Sure. It uses seventy-five percent less energy and it lasts ten times longer. Why well, are you giving that away? Um, um, to help save the planet. Oh, help save the cool. planet, courtesy that's, of the Sierra Club. That's a lot. Thank you very much. Have a good day, day sir. Would you like some free CFL light bulbs? Do your part to help save the planet. Here you go. Right. Have a good day. <laughs> Most people want to help the environment and they don't know what else to do. And I think this project has helped them in that way. Hi. Hi. We're giving away these free CFL light bulbs. Would you like to get one? I would love to. There you go. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. You're we really appreciate it and all your efforts to save the planet. <laughs> as well as the light bulb project, there's been composting projects, recycling projects, setting up recycling centers, a lot that's being done. Everybody can make a difference. It might be a small change in your house, a big change, but every little thing really helps.
This project um, made me feel that I could do All right, so again, these are all ways that you can get involved. Now, one of the videos that you saw featured political activism. That meant that young people going to City Hall to get actual policies enacted, and that's something that you can be involved in here locally. There are conservation advocacy groups here that you can get involved with that can hopefully result in local policies. Uh, and some of these have even gone to the national level. And any time a federal law is passed, this represents a massive effort. It requires more energy than just sitting there with your eyes closed, waiting for the time to expire. It requires caring. And some of these national movements are like the Environmental Protection Agency, an advocacy group that was created at the federal level. The Clean Air Act a law requiring companies to produce vehicles that pollute less. The Clean Water Act, a law requiring companies to stop pushing chemicals into our groundwater. And then finally, the Endangered Species Act, a law that required the protection of species that we consider in danger of extinction. These laws are huge. And again, you know, it's more than just sitting there listening to a lesson. These laws each represent movements that began at the local level, involving millions of people working together, petitioning Congress to do something that can affect our planet. the Green Ambassadors, which is so powerful to me and I love it, is because we get to do the solution. It's not the teacher doing it. It's actually youth empowering youth because we're in charge of it. In our Green Ambassadors class, we work on projects that can help our school first and then we can go out in the community to teach others about it. And of course, that all goes back to our ecological footprint and climate change. Here in the United States, we, we're trying to change it, and many countries don't see that. They just think that we're bad, we're the big monster that wants to destroy the planet. Most of our energy comes from fossil fuels, like oil, natural gas, and coal. Once you burn them, they emit CO2. And the greenhouse gases are like laying a blanket on our planet, and it's heating it up. Our school is going through a green transformation. Our school, we had a lunch system that would create so much waste. So last semester, we worked on a project called Clean Plate Club. These are our waste stations. We have compost, fruits, vegetables, eggshells. We have recycled, so plastic bottles only, numbers one and two. And we have landfill. And we want to raise awareness, and we also want people to see what can go in the landfill. Right here is our number one method of compost. We're using an old bathtub to put our organic matter from the waste bins. Worms are breaking it down to compost. We're gonna get good, healthy soil for our plants, our fruit trees. We planted 60 different fruit trees with over 30 varieties. Trees get the carbon dioxide out of the air, so planting more trees can reduce your carbon footprint. 
The coolest thing for me was that we actually got to plant the trees so we can go back 20 years later and say, hey, I planted that avocado tree, I planted that kiwi tree. And we also went into the community door to door asking people, do you want a kiwi tree? Do you want an avocado tree? We planted 40 different trees in the community. That's the most important thing to educate people because they don't know. I don't like when we judge other people instead of teaching them. One way that our school has taken our learnings and teachings out to the rest of the community, to the rest of the city, we teach little kids about what they can do and take back to their homes, to their schools, to make their school environmentally friendly. They're trying to reduce the plastic by getting the canteens and so that they don't have to be buying plastic bottles. We're at the Environmental Youth Conference and I'm dressed as a plastic bag monster. Everyone is walking up to me taking pictures and laughing. <laughs> But this is a serious problem. Climate change, it's hitting us. I mean, we need solar panels, we need wind energy. We don't need to be going offshore drilling for oil. There are the solutions, and, but we need to use them. You'd really be surprised what one Earth Positive solution can do to a community. We're doing all of this for the seventh generation, for my sister's kids and her kids, kids, kids. We can do the simplest things to make this world a better place. If I can learn how to care about the earth, you can too. You can make a difference. So modern efforts, like you see in these videos. Um, roughly two-thirds of the water in our country today is considered safe for swimming and fishing. That means 33% of the water in our country is not suitable to even wade in. They are so polluted that the chemicals will cause danger to your health if you get in that water. One third of all the water in our country. Again, we are lucky to live where we are. Now, this statistic has improved greatly since 1972. In fact, in 72, studies showed that over half of the water in our country was unsafe to swim in. For example, the Pigeon River. Now you can go whitewater rafting on, it's fun, it's safe to swim in, and you can even fish out of parts of those waters. You weren't even supposed, it was considered a dead ecosystem until the 1990s. It was not safe for swimming or anything. It's still called the dirty bird, it's still pretty nasty below Canton. While if you go to the headwaters of the pigeon, some of the most crystal clear, clean water you've ever seen. Now, between 1970 and 97, the nation's yearly production of lead emissions actually went down from 221 million tons of lead emissions dumped into our atmosphere down to 4 million. Quite amazing. In fact, between 1970 and 1997, the amount of national park land in our country has tripled. More and more the consensus has developed that it's human activities, it's burning of fossil fuels, cutting down of forests that put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that's causing the warming. I work in the Arctic and the Arctic is part of the earth that's warming the most. We're working on the six largest rivers flowing into the Arctic Ocean, We're trying to figure out how changes in those rivers can feed back to influence global climate. 
And essentially what we were doing was going and collecting water samples to help us understand whether things are changing. We spent a lot of time talking with the elders in these communities and asking them about their observations of change that might be related to climate change. And these are people that are 80 years old, grew up living entirely off the land almost. We were in the Lena River, where Anya's from, and we were on a ship for two weeks, all the way down the Lena River to just about to the Arctic Ocean. I was traveling with my dad a lot uh, since my childhood and seeing how he does his work. Anya was along. She had just turned 13 and she is the daughter, the captain of the boat that we use for sampling on the Lena. She'd be right there every time we were sampling and became a part of the crew. It was big help with the work that we were doing. I explained how more samples would help us figure out how things varied seasonally. They asked me to make water samples during the winter mm -hmm. and he said that you can make something really good for for world. I said, oh, of course, it will be interesting to see what he can do. And I gave her maybe 20 bottles, and then we disappeared for five or six months. It turned out that every two weeks, she had been out on her father's boat collecting samples or during the winter, drilling holes through the ice to collect these water samples. I didn't understand that uh, Elena River is if you can sample it, you can know something about global changes that it gives you so much. Well, it just started with this one girl. It, it grew to include her classmates and teachers. And finally, then we were trying to replicate that at various other sites around the Arctic. Max and other scientists came to our school. Uh, and uh, they were very amazed at children interested in everything. I don't know if it's their formal education that gives them an appreciation of the natural world, but the way they live does. So, you know, they see what their parents are doing, which are going out on the land and fishing and hunting or collecting berries. They live in nature. When I first met her, you could just see the twinkle in her eye that she still has. And I've learned probably as much from her and from her parents and from people in her villages as certainly she's learned from me. You can change the world, so do something. <laughs>
Um, you can be involved just by simply cleaning up, spend time outdoors, pick up trash. It's very simple. My name is Felix Finkbeiner. I'm 11 years old from Germany. Two years ago, after the warm winter, my teacher asked me to give a presentation about the so, climate crisis. Felix came home and said, hey, I have to make a PowerPoint presentation next week. I said, but you need Papa. I have no idea how to do that. But finally, he worked out by himself. He was researching in the internet, and he learned about uh, Vangari Matai. I found out that Vangari Matai planted 30 million trees in Africa in 30 years. So I thought if Vangari Matai can plant 30 million trees, we students in Germany can also plant 1 million trees. He probably didn't didn't think what a million is, and he probably didn't think what he will do to his parents, because it's a lot of work right now. I got a lot of help from my parents. I don't think I could have done it without them. This is the first tree we have planted. It's an apple tree. This tree was that size when we planted it two years ago. Each tree that we plant takes up 10 kilos of CO2 every year. And each tree is a symbol for climate justice. We've already done six plants for the Planet Academies. At the academies, there are scientists giving presentations. Sometimes I'm giving presentations. My presentation is about climate justice. Climate justice means that every person in the world is allowed to pollute the air with two tons of carbon. Not as today that a US American pollutes the air with 20 tons of carbon a year, an average German or European 10 tons of carbon a year, an African a half a ton. Vorträge machen in den Schulen und After going to a plant for the Planet Academy, learning about giving presentations and learning about planting trees. Every ambassador gets information to make their own presentations. Thank you very much for taking part at this weekend for, the, for being a climate ambassador. And you get this certificate if? Uh, if you promise to give at least, or try to give at least one presentation in a month. Do you promise? Yeah. Today I'm working together with thousands of other students in Germany and many other countries to plant one million trees in each country. We're going in the forest to plant trees, learn about different kinds of trees, climb trees and have fun. We're here in the forest at near Duisburg and uh, we're planting some trees uh, to help climate change. We have already planted 290,000 trees in Germany, um, and 550,000 trees are already pledged. Now we've come here to do the tree climbing, which is the most fun part of the day. <laughs> There are adults and politicians that changed how they taught and um, really understood what I talked about. He knows that children can do something. They can change a lot and they can make a difference. If the adults don't do enough, we have to do it because we will live on Earth for another 80 or 90 years and our children will live even longer.
So I wanted to give you some um, exciting local information here. Uh, one of my favorite places in our county is DuPont State Forest. I spend an awful lot of time there. I can actually guide trips. I know every trail in the forest. I'm proud to say that. And I've spent an enormous amount of time in DuPont, uh, as well as Pisgah, as well as Green River Game Lands, as well as all our natural areas. I just think they're extremely important. Uh, but a little history about DuPont. Uh, in 1907, uh, excuse me, 1957, the DuPont Corporation worked with Champion Paper to harvest timber from this property. That's why if you spend time in DuPont, you won't see a lot of older timber. It's all rather new. Um, in 1997, DuPont sold its business uh, and the plant along with the property. Uh, so if you ever go to DuPont, you won't see the factory. It's in the center of the forest. You've got to go kind of... Um, Underneath Bridal Vale Falls, there's a little unmarked trail you can access. You can actually see the plant, but you're not supposed to. They've got it closed off because they don't want visitors to see the plant. In fact, there's parts of the plant that because of pollution, when it became a film company, uh, some of the waters there are still unsafe to wade in. Uh, though the Little River and the lakes are very clean and safe, they've been um, restored, uh, but some of the parts of it... Uh, are still off limits. Now in 1999 a private developer bought this property the entire DuPont State Forest for 6.35 million dollars in 1999. Can you imagine? I mean 6.35 million dollars is chump change when you consider how big and beautiful that forest is. Now in 2000 construction and subdivision of the property began. It was originally going to be private property. So if you ever go ride around Lake Julia or Airstrip or parts of uh, Turkey Knob, um, these are all trails. If you go out there, you'll see them. You'll see old housing developments, evidence of construction in these areas. In fact, until about three years ago, there was a half-finished house actually dried in over by Lake Julia. Uh, come off of Reason Over Trail, about to connect to conservation. It's right there near the ranger station. Uh, it, it was going to be this beautiful million dollar home. In fact, the airstrip was built so that company executives could fly in on corporate retreats into this big giant piece of private property. Well, now you can all go see it. You can all spend time there. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. In fact, it attracts so many tourists and people to this area. Um, and it was going to be closed off. Now, uh, Mr. Savage and his wife, uh, along with many other community members, were involved in a movement to um, get the state to purchase this land. Uh, now, you see, the movement began in 2000, uh, and eventually the state claimed eminent domain and wound up purchasing the property for $12 million, almost double of what the developer had originally paid for. You see, he was going to subdivide the property. There would have been houses at the top of Triple Falls with no trespassing signs. If you don't believe me, I used to go to Waterfalls, go to Fentress Falls in Middle Tennessee. You have to trespass to even go visit. Um, yet, though, uh, state navigability uh, waterway rights meant that we could find a public place to park, which usually involved a bridge, and walk down the stream bed to access the falls. So as long as I stayed in the high water uh, on the stream bed, we could go anywhere we wanted. But there are a number of beautiful places that are closed off. But yet DuPont is a big success story. Started, we were in sixth grade. We were concerned about climate change. Because of sea level change, Miami, out of all the coastal cities in the world, will have the greatest economic loss. At a certain point, we couldn't stop thinking, is there anything that we can do? I'm Nicole Martinez. I'm Melissa Quintana. I'm Madeline Cowan. I'm Larissa Weinstein, 
and we're the green team. The green team would go around from homeroom to homeroom telling students about one thing that they could do to reduce their carbon footprint. We started by turning off computers. We began to recycle, we turned off lights. We actually weather stripped the doors and windows so that the air can't escape to conserve air conditioning. We turned off the AC units. Instead, we opened the windows and the doors. We could hear birds singing outside. There are so many little things that you can do that will save energy and money. Throughout the school year, we had this thing called the greenometer. It was a thermometer. We would see energy that we were saving. We became a Dreaming Green School, which is a nonprofit that helps us to save energy, reduce our carbon footprint. We save tens of thousands of dollars. We learn how our actions affect the environment and affect something greater than ourselves. My friends and I called in somebody to give us an estimate on putting in solar panels. The man who came in emphasized that before we need to do this, we can try to reduce our energy consumption. And one of the great ideas that he gave us was to paint the roof of our school white. We convinced them to actually donate all the materials, the time, and the manpower to paint the roof of our school white. Painting the roof white saved us thousands of dollars. It didn't require as much air conditioning that translated directly to money savings. We didn't just do this ourselves. We built an entire network with um, faculty, administration students, and other members of the community. Our principal allowed us to look at energy bills, so we were able to do an energy audit on the entire school. And you can go online to put in your address and it does energy audits. It gives you graphs on how much you're saving or what exactly. you can do. It gives you tips. Yeah. And I it think that's pretty... It compares it to the same month right. of the previous year. It just became an incredible project. It became something beyond my wildest dream. And all of our teachers were very helpful. We spoke with the custodians and convinced them to play a part in going green. Sure, I'll go back. Thank you. If we custodians should see an air condition on, we turn it off. So we are going greener, and I'm proud to say that. We were able to uh, vastly decrease the amount of energy our school used. Going green is a win-win situation for everybody. My eighth grade year, we saved $39,000. And then the year after that, we saved another 14000 if each school in the district were to implement these, we would have saved $33 million. That's awesome. Marissa, Maddie, Melissa, and Nicole wanted to go beyond the classroom with what they had learned about energy and environmental science and make a difference in their school and community. We made a presentation for school board members about how the entire district could be more environmentally friendly. They were extremely inspired, and they also saw the financial benefits of going green. The savings were astronomical. It was exciting to go to these school board members. You could show them the data. You could say, look, you have no idea how much money you could be saving. Our students went and spoke to the authorities at the Miami International Airport. Throughout our presentations with the school board chairman with um, Miami International Airport, we emphasized that it doesn't take that much to reduce your energy consumption. We were taken seriously because we had real statistics and information. We could show the people at the airport, this is how much you will save. It was something that we were really very proud of. Not only are we making a change at the school level, but we're trying to make a change citywide, nationwide, worldwide. Maddie and I graduated from here at Carver, and we then moved on to Coral Gables High School. Coming off this sort of high of change and excitement and everything we were doing here at Carver, we had a list. We wanted everything we had done at Carver to happen at Gables. Almost the entire school at this point is recycling paper and plastic and cans. Going green really helps save money everywhere. 75% of the money that we save at our school gets returned to us. We've saved four or $5,000 this year at Gables High alone. Small changes that add up to big savings. You can save millions of dollars, and this is just one small county in Florida. Can you imagine if every other county did this? Can you imagine if every other state did this? It's right on so many levels, you know, the, a moral level and at a financial mm -hmm. level. And if, despite all these obstacles, it's just if you keep trying, yeah. you can't lose, you're saving money. And more importantly, you're saving the planet. Kids do have power. Kids have a say in what happens. I felt like I could change things. I could just strap on my cape and move.
Now, many environmental problems still exist. Um, and, and the ongoing debate in this election is balancing conservation with economic growth. Uh, one thing we have to be concerned about is the greenhouse effect, and that is the rise in temperature, global temperature that the Earth experiences because of certain gases in the atmosphere that trap energy from the sun. You see, without these gases, heat would escape back into space, and the Earth's average temperature would be far, far colder. Go to the creek. Okay, so we have to go beyond those two hills. Do you hear that? Jackson, that's a broad shouldered hawk. There's a creek. It's really close. Wanna go find it? Okay, wait. Let's go this way. I love birds because they're so interesting. They are beautiful. They all have personalities. I think the reason that a lot of people have chosen birds as the symbol of the environment is because they have a sense of freedom. They can fly. They own the air. My dad's side of the family lives on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. Those beaches are beautiful. Or at least they were. The animals there were amazing. The crabs that would pop out of the hole, scree and plop back in, and the sanderlings that would go and hunt after them, and the brown pelicans, and the certain great blue heron, who I think has become one of my best friends. They'll go down into the water, take a fish, put it out, shake it, and swallow it head first. Catastrophic disaster at sea, a column of fire blasting into the sky. The explosion happened aboard a mobile offshore drilling unit called the Deepwater Horizon. More than 175 million gallons of oil have spewed into the Gulf. When I first heard about the oil spill, you know, it broke my heart. My dad and my grandfather were talking on speakerphone. Olivia heard um, that it was spilling into the Gulf. They were as angry as could be because they grew up loving those pristine beaches and swimming in those waters and seeing those birds. After we spoke to my father-in-law, we had dinner and Olivia, I had never seen her so upset. I actually started breaking down crying at the table and I just, I couldn't help it. The thought that was running through my head was, it's nesting season for the birds. What are we going to do? She knew immediately that the brown pelicans would be feeding their babies, that they would not leave their nests. I knew those birds were going to be affected, and some of them won't make it. When the impacts first started coming to shore, the Audubon folks were meeting those boats. They were taking care of the crates while our transport vans were taking runs back and forth to the rehabilitation centers. So basically, they were the front line. First care three. Thinking about it that whole night, I decided to write a letter to Audubon. It was signed, 11 years old and willing to help. The letter basically said, I will do 500 drawings. For people who donate, they would get a drawing. And who knows, maybe I'll raise $200. I'll try. I've drawn ever since I was a little girl, ever since I could hold a pencil. The donation started a couple weeks after the explosion of the rig. Let me get it thick with a nice big brush. The drawings were called for in three weeks. It took me three months to finish them. (laughs) 
It was such a media whirlwind. First, it went to the Mobile Press Register. Then it spread to the UK. The Guardian UK published an article saying, schoolgirl shames BP. From there, it went viral. Then Huffington Post, then AOL Philanthropy. It was going crazy. My mother was getting like 100 emails an hour. Belgian newspapers, Italian TV. My mom was having a heart attack. <gasps> what should I do? All these emails, <gasps> Mainstream media in the United States picked it up. CBS News, USA Today, People. 144 million people had seen my story. Two months, 144 million people. It tells you, people want to help, but they just don't know how. That's why I think they need a role model, like a youth, to say, if a child can do it, so can I. I can make a difference. Olivia encouraged us to meet with our representatives in Washington, D.C., to advocate for alternative energy and the birds. We actually met with Ken Salazar. We should stop offshore drilling, stop relying on other countries. Have you ever seen a solar panel break down and it ends a whole ecosystem, destroys a whole way of life for people and animals? Have you ever heard of a solar spill? You don't have to do what I did, but everything that you do for our planet counts. And lastly, uh, many of these ongoing challenges. You see, there are naturally occurring greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, etc. cetera. Um, but where we can control the amount of greenhouse gases is the burning of fossil fuels, because these do add to the level of gases, and they do cause global warming. In fact, most of the Earth's scientists agree uh, and believe that this could prompt not only severe flooding, in parts of the world because of the melting of the polar ice caps, but even drought in other parts of the world because of global, global climate change. I've always enjoyed living in the Berkshires because I find it to be a very unique, close-knit um, place to live. We have a very extensive vegetable garden. We've been getting beef and pork from a local farmer, and we get our own eggs from our chicken. So in eighth grade, um, a year ago, I saw what the high school students were doing with this food initiative, and I thought it was fantastic. And I just knew I wanted to become a part of it the second I got into high school. I first started working with the food project my junior year. My friend Sophie Randolph graduated last year. She started the food initiative with Zoe Borden. Sophie Randolph and I were both part of the student senate. We both felt that an issue was school lunches. If I have to eat pizza, I will, but I don't know. It's never looked appealing to me. I bring my own lunch because I'm a vegetarian, and they don't really offer vegetarian options in the cafeteria. We represent the student body. They want better lunches. We saw a lot of processed foods in our lunches. It doesn't have as many nutrients as fresh food. You get served cut peaches in syrup, but we have these amazing peaches that are grow out here. We have great apples that grow right, actually right next to us on Windy Hill Farm. And we're getting served apples in plastic bags that are pre-sliced. Why not tap into our natural resources? That really started the discussion about if it was even feasible to get local lunch in the cafeteria. 
and everyone at the PTA was like, yeah, we can do this. A uh, community member had a connection to state representative Smitty Pignatelli. Smitty Pignatelli recommended that we hold a roundtable meeting with people around the community to sort of garner support. Welcome to this meeting this morning. I'm Mary Ann Young, and I'm the principal here at Monument Mountain. And Students brought in community partners. Faculty. Matt Massiero from Guido's Marketplace. Art Ames and Matt Novick from the Berkshire Co-op. The product is grown right here. Smitty Pignatelli he helped us invite uh, state representatives from the Department of Education, Public Health, the leader of Berkshire Grown, which is just centered around locally grown food in the Berkshires. The uh, pretty much everyone showed up. Monument Mountain would be would like to be considered as a pilot project. For Our history. students have said we want to improve and really create a dynamic lunch program. Our food service personnel says, you're asking us to do this. We really want to do that. But we are short-staffed. We are underfunded. We are regulated. We get 225 for lunch. That is supposed to pay for all the food that comes in, the payroll, the health insurance. You can't eat from McDonald's. Um, $2.25. Oh. <laughs> We planned a local lunch pilot day. The lunch was fantastic, and people really loved it. Our cafeteria purchases through Cisco, which in turn gets their food from other sources. Who knows where? Shipping this food all around the world to get it into our cafeteria creates a huge amount of CO2, a main contributor to global warming. So for example, locally grown apples travel 61 miles, whereas conventionally sourced apples travel 1,726 miles. So you can see how much carbon that's really creating, because it's, it's a lot of carbon. The veggies that they have are usually always from the garden that's down there. Project Sprout was started five years ago by three students who decided that they wanted more local and fresh vegetables in the cafeteria. Here is our greenhouse, and here we grow radishes and lettuce during the winter and other root vegetables that go up to the cafeteria. Kohlrabi, carrots, spinach, tomatoes. People come out on Saturdays, whether it's kids from the school or people around the community. We weed the garden, plant the garden, harvest. That food, in turn, gets served in the cafeteria. They bring in lunches from the local garden and, like, fresh veggies and food, so that's kind of nice. One of our main problems at Project Sprout is that our main growing season is in the summer, when school is not in session. So we've been working with the Berkshire Co-op to create a bartering system. The students during the summer will give us their produce, we will sell that produce, and in the winter when they need that produce in return, in carrots and anything else, we'll simply give them that product in exchange. Once we had the pilot launch day under our belt, we were granted one day a month that we could totally take over the menu. fresh food will have more nutrients and kids will have more energy during the day. One of the main concerns that food services had was that they didn't have enough staff. You have to prepare fresh food. You can't just unfreeze it. You can't just take it out of a can. So it was more work and that's where we stepped in to say we'll help with that extra work. So we had students in the cafeteria mixing avocados. We had teachers cutting vegetables. We planned a rotating schedule so that each of us could plan uh, with the help of a local chef each month. In October, I worked with Brian Alberg of the Red Lion Inn. I went to the Red Lion Inn and we sat down and worked out a menu. The Red Lion ordered a prize-winning steer from the local fair. And Brian Alberg was like, we want to use it for the lunch, for the local meatloaf. And then he actually had all the local farms delivered to him, and then he got all of it and delivered it to us. And then he cooked it with us, and students also helped out. And it was, yeah, it was a good day. 
Not only was our meatloaf grass-fed, it was a really great opportunity for us to show students where our food is coming from. We realized that that local food day every month was a big process. So we're aiming toward getting a few locally grown items in our lunches a few times a week. If we purchase more from local farms and local grocery stores, then obviously that gives them business. It'll increase the local economy, and I think that's a great goal to work towards. Our generation, we're the ones that are going to have to be the problem solvers for tomorrow. And why not start here and reduce our carbon footprint by buying locally? And so we have these ongoing challenges and debates. You see, the United States is the largest producer of greenhouse gas emissions. And sadly, we have done little to scale back the output of many of these gases. Because you see, many business leaders insist that the measures to cool down the atmosphere are too costly and would hurt our economy. And so now I'd like to share another example of how you as a young person can get We're really, really close. We've been really close since like kindergarten. Working as a team is, it gives you much more courage than if you're just working as an individual. If you're alone, it's always scary. I have these two friends, Mari McBride and Lily Georgopoulos, and I've known them since I was before preschool. I think what binds us together is our passion for what's going on around us. We're all doers. So when we were little, when we were first hearing about climate change, it was on the news, it was in the papers, our parents were talking about it. I just felt despair. It was worse than concern. It was just sadness. I didn't think there was anything anyone could do. We got older and we realized that the grown-ups weren't doing anything about it. We kind of lost our faith in adults. If they care about us, they should care about our future too. No one is going to protect our future for us, and so we were on our own. I think the fight against climate change is kind of like the fight of Harry Potter and the Death Eaters. Harry Potter was born into this problem, just like we were born into this problem. We saw that Harry Potter was brave. Even though he was a kid, he made a difference. We kind of saw him as a role model. When I was watching the Young Voices for the Planet films, I'd never seen kids in action before, and it was really, really amazing. And I realized that there was nothing different between me and the kids on those screens, and I could be doing what they were doing. We thought, can we do something like this? Is it possible? So I got really excited, and I got on a notepad, and I started writing. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I was going to do something. All of a sudden, this idea just popped into my head. Save tomorrow, that would be the group name. Here in Lexington, the town laws didn't allow solarization of our town buildings. We learned that there was a chance for all three of us to come and talk about climate change at the town meeting. Lily and Mari and I all wrote some statements to try 
and get them to allow solar panels to go on public buildings. At first, we were a little bit scared. These are a bunch of grown-ups. They run the world. To stop climate change, everyone has to pitch in and help. That means all of us right here in Lexington. We decided to quote Dr. Seuss using a quote from the Lorax. We said it together. And remember, as Dr. Seuss said, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. And then the whole town meeting just stands up and starts clapping. Even the moderator was clapping. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? It kind of hit us. We had helped this article pass unanimously. It is unanimous. The motion carries. We literally just skipped out of the town hall. We had helped to get solar panels on all the town buildings. We weren't just helpless little girls. We have more power than we'd ever imagined in our wildest dreams. After that, it was like, well, we did that. What can we do now? We found out that they were planning to tear down part of our forest right next to Alice's house. It's so quiet and peaceful out there. All you can hear is like birds and, and wind. And makes you feel really and free. And it's just like a, a whole separate world. We have forts back there. We have owls back there that we know. We know where all the animals live. We love those forests. And it was devastating to think that they could tear, just tear down all those trees without even thinking about it. We immediately knew that we weren't gonna let this happen. We made a petition to save our woods. To whom it may concern, we are the kids of Lexington, and we have too many amazing memories of Mountain Road without anyone disturbing the beautiful forest there. And then we went around to the whole cafeteria asking people, do you want to sign this? Then we turned it in. And I think that they were really just overwhelmed. A bunch of school children all fighting for this little lot of woods behind their houses. This is like where they play. And I'm pretty sure they hadn't even realized that. One of the reasons why people listen to kids is because we're trying to do what's right. Whereas some adults, they're doing it for the money. But they realized how much this plot of land meant to all of us. And I think that really helped them make their decision. They kept the woods there and the woods are still there today. We saved the woods from from there to beyond my house over there. Yeah. It's Huge more like a land. corridor in between two big woods. Yeah. A Save passageway a little... for the animals. We realized, wait, we have a new school. We can put solar panels on our new school, reducing CO2 emissions and really doing something about climate change. Our whole school will be helping save the world. We need to go out there and take a risk to make a difference. We're taking it into our hands now. Seeing that we do have power and that we can make a change in the world, it's really inspiring, it really changes you. And I think it's just gonna grow from here. So find your team, find your passion, find your power. We could power our whole town on clean solar energy. And so again, these videos I'll make available online soon. Um, we have to understand that Americans can constitute only 5% of the world's population, but yet we consume 24% of the world's energy. 
In fact, nearly all of this energy comes from fossil fuels, and that being oil, coal, and natural gas. Uh, for example, Duke Energy just recently approved construction of a $1 billion natural gas energy plant here in North Carolina. This story is about Pete Seeger, a group of kids in the river, trying to make the world a better place. I'm Elise Fox, and I'm one of the Rivertown kids. We live in the city of Beacon, next to the Hudson River. My name is Louisa. I started with the Rivertown kids when I was in fourth grade. My name is Owen. I've been in the Rivertown kids for almost a year. I like that you can sing with Pete Seeger. That's my favorite part. Pete Seeger is really famous for his singing. He talks about what's going on in the earth and he tries to change it with one of the songs he sings. If I had a hammer, in the Pete Seeger is a folk idol. All over this land. He's known for speaking out for social justice and singing with his banjo, songs like If I Had a Hammer and This Land Is Your Land. Pete started coming into the classroom. I was just like, wow, this amazing man is in our classroom and he's actually happy that we're singing his songs. And that's when our teacher Terry was like, hey, we really got something going on here. We learned a lot about the Hudson River and how we should be protecting it. The Hudson River used to be filled with like PCBs and stuff and it was getting into the fish and there was just a whole bunch of pollution in there. Pete Seeger built the Sloop Clearwater with a bunch of his friends because he wanted to get it out that the river needed to be cleaned up. When I sing, it makes me feel like I'm a part of something big. When we were on the river, it wasn't really polluted anymore because Pete already got it cleaned up. It was this majestic thing, just looking out in awe because the mountains just look so beautiful. And it was this nice, peaceful place. Put them together. Take it from Dr. King. You too can learn to sing the drum, the drum. That's it, you, that time you got it. Pete has this energy about him that was so amazing that it just spread onto you, like this happiness and this joy being around him. Now you know the whole chorus. Pete Seeger is one of like the most awesomest person in the world. Pete really liked the way we sung and then he wrote us this letter that said maybe we should do a concert. And if the concert went well, he wanted to do an album with us. The biggest concert we did with Pete was the Clearwater Hudson River Revival. It was scary at first because we were on this huge stage with like a 2,000 person audience. We wrote a few songs using melodies from other folk songs, and we wrote our own lyrics to them. Our class wrote the song we sing out. We wanted to show them we had a voice, and we wanted to use our voice, even though we were children. Well, you're only kids, they say, and you'll run the world someday. In the meantime, just relax, don't say a word. After a couple of concerts, he was like, I want to do this album with you. Here we go. We 
went into the recording studio. After a little bit of recording, we got into it and we were like just dancing around. We did the album in fourth grade and then in sixth grade, we won the Grammy Award. And I was like, are you serious? We won it? we have a concert honoring Martin Luther King and all his hard work on trying to have equal rights for African Americans. It's the 50th year anniversary of when Martin Luther King did his I Have a Dream speech back in 1963. Pete Seeger, who is an amazing legend, marched with Martin Luther King in the civil rights movement. to be separate water fountains. People couldn't work together, eat together, go to school together, nothing. Pete sang about the bad things that were happening, and he went to jail because of this. Pete tells a lot of great stories, like the one about these kids trying to fight for civil rights. Once they get to the top of the hill that they were climbing, the police officers and the mean, vicious dogs that were going to attack them and the police officer says, you're all under arrest. And like simultaneously, all the kids start singing that song, Ain't Scared of Jail. And it goes, ain't scared of jail, because I want my freedom. I want my freedom. I want my freedom. Ain't scared of jail. My name is Anya Gunn. I've been in Rivertown Kids for about a year. I hope I've changed people by making them look at the world from a different angle. Because music seeps in and moves you, and it makes you think. The Rivertown Kids. A utopia, and this is solar utopia. Come in. Solartopia is a great song because it has great lyrics. One important verse is, but the nuclear plants were built in haste. With too many risks, no place for waste. The Indian Point reactor is about 50 miles from New York City, and there are millions of people living in that city. We should definitely think about what would happen if something went wrong. We use all these power sources, which are destroying our environment. Fossil fuels emit all these harmful gases, many of which are the greenhouse gases that trap in the heat. Solitopia talks about how we should use sustainable energy because it's always going to be there. We're trying to change things by singing the song because I don't think people are going to listen to you if you just talk to them. Even if people aren't really listening to the meaning of the song, it will get stuck in their head and eventually they'll learn the meaning. Song is like an emotional language that everybody can understand.
Peep says a lot of things. Like, we are carrying on what he did. So, we have to live up to that. I'm hopeful because when we sing, we get people to change the world. Now, um, again, another ongoing challenge in debate. It's the question of overseas oil. You see, much of the fuel that America uses comes from overseas. Uh, though we are reducing our dependence on foreign oil, um, this does make us somewhat vulnerable to price increases as well as fuel shortages. And I'd like to compare um, one conservative president's energy plan to uh, President Obama's energy plan. So you can see kind of the differences between a conservative environmental policy and perhaps a liberal environmental policy. So George W. Bush's energy plan proposed loosening regulations on oil and gas exploration, review of gas mileage standards, $4 billion tax credit for the use of hybrid cars, and finally, stressed a commitment to drill for more oil in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Now, environmentalists strongly opposed this plan, uh, claiming that it could damage or even destroy a fragile ecosystem. And so here's a, a quote from George W. Bush uh, on his environmental policies. He said, and I quote, I campaigned hard on the notion of having environmentally sensitive exploration at the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and I think we can do so. And then I wanted to contrast this with President Obama's energy policy currently. Um, he's worked to enact a windfall profits tax to provide a $1,000 energy rebate to American families incentivizing going green. Uh, he's worked to crack down on ex excessive energy speculation, uh, meaning uh, particularly fossil fuels, uh, it, and to work on cracking down on the um, irresponsible drilling, uh, to swap oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to cut prices. Uh, in fact, the price of oil has dropped significantly during his presidency, um, to also encourage uh, tougher fuel economy standards and in fact by law which I believe went into implementation in 2014 uh, new cars do have certain MPG or miles per gallon um, standards that they have to abide by. Um, one of Obama's goals was to get 1 million plug-in hybrid cars on the road by 2015 I'm not sure where he is at that currently but uh, we've of course seen many more hybrid cars and then finally, uh, to create a new $7,000 tax credit uh, to purchase advanced vehicles, which I'm sure you've just heard about the uh, latest electric car, um, which is now affordable. And thanks to these federal tax credits, um, it's comparable in price uh, to traditional automobile. Now, um, Part of Obama's policy also was to establish a national low carbon fuel standard, uh, meaning that cars would have to abide by a policy uh, to produce a limited amount of carbon fuel emissions. Uh, also a quote, use it or lose it approach to existing oil and gas leases uh, to promote 
the responsible domestic production of oil and natural gas. And then finally, the bottom line, Obama's goal since he became president was to lead the United States to become a leader on the issue of climate change.